So we are slowly opening the session on the sustainable blue economy. So we are slowly opening the session on the sustainable blue economy. So we are and we have a loop issue which is solved immediately, so I'm very happy. So um, our audience is also slowly starting to be there. Hopefully we'll see this number going up and up uh, yeah, more and more. My name is Lefteris Mamais. I am co-founder and director at Eventflow, and I will be very happy to be moderating this discussion. This is part of the FIRE Forum. And for those who are not fully familiar with what the FIRE Forum is, it's essentially an effort to bring together practitioners from different segments or sectors, in this case, marine and maritime, with solution providers, and draw together a strategic research and innovation agenda for the future. Of course, the main uh, focus uh, is on Earth observation, and that's why this is hosted uh, under the auspices of the Expandio Forum. So um, for all of those listening to us, this discussion will take place in the following manner. We will have an introductory uh, presentation by the sector lead, which is Philippe Monbe um, from Paul Mer Bretagne Atlantic, um, which will be followed by a presentation, an inspiring presentation by our two evangelists representing the marine and maritime sector. I, I will introduce them in a moment. Um, and then we will um, engage in hopefully a very stimulating discussion um, uh, that will be basically organized around three waves. So we will try to focus on trends, challenges and gaps, and then opportunities for EO and how to seize them. Uh, in this whole time frame, there will be uh, the opportunity for the audience to raise questions in the questions tab. You saw Zeynep um, make that point too. And there will be a few polls in the interactivity part where we um, definitely invite all of you to participate because this will allow us in the first place to understand who is in the audience and then what you think about certain topics. So having said all that, I pass the floor to Phil, who will um, share the presentation as the sector lead to tell us where things are today and explain a little bit some of the high level ambitions around the blue economy. Try Still to share now we my, can hear you. Yeah. my screen, and obviously I made I made a mistake here. I think I blocked my uh, my screen. Could you, as a backup? Uh, yes, 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 yes. I'm very Just sorry. No, no, that's all right. Just click it around. Might, it might take a minute. Um, in the in the meantime, I should say that you are also seeing as audience a drawing which is sort of progressing in front of your eyes. So we have a graphic recorder who will be um, attempting to capture the different points that we will be, uh, that we will be raising. Um, yeah, and, and, and hopefully by the end of this, uh, and specifically in the plenary that follows afterwards, uh, you would see how, um, how this all comes together. You will have a rapporteur to present the uh, results of this discussion. Uh, you so will now- know, uh, How this all comes together, you will have I have the presentation from Phil, and I will share. Sorry, very sorry. I just uh, no, that's all right. Wrong action. I'm I'm fully embracing the perks of of a digital event today, so no worries. Okay, let's digital, try digital to life. see how this works. Could be a bit complicated. There we go. Let's try. So Phil, works. The floor is yours normally. It's probably coming. Not yet. Do you see the screen? I can't see it, but. Uh... As far as I'm concerned, I'm sharing my screen now. OK. OK, we started off on the wrong foot. <laughs> I don't so... see it, but I can't start if you, everybody sees. Uh... Sorry, sorry. It's not no, I think no one actually sees it. To, to start. <laughs> this is okay. Everybody's now still uh, shaking off stories that they just got over lunch. So, Zainab, okay, yeah, if, if you could help us with that, that would be great.
in the meantime, I have started the poll that helps people um, identify themselves by explaining their relationship to, to the marine and maritime industry. So I kindly invite all people attending to, to fill this in, to tell us who they are. Okay, there we go. Yes, so, uh, well, I guess uh, even if it's not in full screen, I can start. Um, sorry, I'll try to catch up the, the time I lost sure, by sure, my sure. mistake. Um, so I just named my talk uh, Earth Observation Technology for a Smarter Maritime World. I could uh, even say uh, a more sustainable maritime world. If you go to the next slide, I've got a, a question for uh, for everybody. Why why Earth Observation fits so well with, uh, with uh, the maritime activities? You have an idea? I move to the next slide. The answer is quite simple. If you can push one more, there's no no infrastructure at sea, nothing. So couldn't be better to use satellite uh, to to sort of uh, communicate, to uh, locate, and and to observe uh, the sea. It's not like on land where you can set up a lot of things. On the ocean, it's not possible. You can change slide, please. And you can put um, all the way one and one more time. So you have three kind of, I'm not going to enter in detail for that, but uh, this uh, absence of uh, infrastructure and facilities at sea, uh, it's uh, obviously uh, compensed by uh, satellite. And satellite can do basically communication, uh, geolocalization, and observation. And that's where we we are um, focusing today uh, earth observation ne next slide maritime activities the highly diverse activities um the way we see the things in our maritime cluster and jonathan probably uh, would uh, would say the same thing uh we have uh, different kind of activities could be defense security and safety it could be uh, shipbuilding and leisure boat building and leisure activities could be uh, what is quite growing, uh, mine uh, energy uh, development, mining resources, deep sea mining. Could be mine biological, biological resources, including fisheries, aquaculture, but also blue biotech. So uh, that includes uh, the management of uh, resources, especially on the coastal area. Could be environment and coastal planning. That could include uh, water quality and other uh, uh, coastal management uh, uh, development. Uh, uh, and could be uh, ports and maritime shipping. Um, this is quite a huge uh, part of the economy, and the blue economy is still growing. Uh, the uh, OCDE uh, uh, forecast a, a double of the activity for the, for the next uh, 10 years. So it might represent 3 trillion uh, US dollars for, for the, this world, uh, what we call the blue, uh, blue economy. If you go to the next slide. So in Europe, it's it's quite uh, it's quite huge in terms of activity, and more and more, and at least in France, but I'm sure it's it's uh, it's the same thing in other countries. Uh, it's it's sort of the 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 promising activities to to put back the uh, the economy on track. Um, so, but uh, overall, in Europe, uh, in terms of uh, revenue, coastal uh, tourism brings uh, forty percent of the revenue. And also uh, ports and uh, maritime transport brings uh, a lot of uh, revenue. And in terms of employment, uh, logically, uh, coastal tourism brings uh, a lot of uh, employment uh, to the to the sector. But we, we also have uh, all what is related to living resources. So that's include fisheries and aquaculture, but also ports activities. And uh, along the way, there's a uh, some sort of emerging activities, even if uh, some of them existed before, but uh, it start to be uh, more and more significant, especially the uh, all what is related to the blue um, biotechnologies. Uh, also, the employment in the maritime defense is, is growing up. And uh, as I said, um, marine renewable energies and especially offshore winds uh, start to, to kick off uh, really, really well uh, in Europe. If you go to the next slide. So I'll start 
try to um, to put uh, in perspective uh, the evolution since uh, the 70s. Um, if you go on the left side, it's the side of the ship uh, that uh, carry containers. So in the in the 70s, we have a ship that probably holds uh, 150 containers, and today we we have this one ship would be able to carry uh, more than 2000 uh, 22000 containers so there's uh, uh, in in 30 40 years uh, there was like a huge uh, change in the maritime world you can see on the right side um the different uh, 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 curves uh, you can see the the progression of the world trade in red and uh, just uh, the blue line just below is uh, maritime trade so can see that uh, uh, almost everything, uh, all goods that are uh, uh, shipped in the world, uh, most of them, I think there's 90 or 95 percent of them, uh, is using the sea. So it's it's something that is really important and and still growing. Go to the next uh, slide. But I could use also uh, some other example. I just use shipping because it's some sort of uh, iconic for uh, maritime activities. But uh, we could use the same kind of. Uh, of trains for aquaculture, fisheries, and stuff. Uh, on the same uh, on the same way, um, I try to to sh to show you, but uh, I'm sure the discussion uh, later on we will discuss that. But uh, where we started uh, with uh, satellite and Earth observation in particular, and where we are today. So on the left side, you have a SAR images just uh, picturing a boat uh, in the middle of the sea. You can see that even if SAR Im images are not Usually high resolution, you can see that it's pretty hard to to tell if it's a, a, a star in the in, in the sky or if it's a boat on, on the sea. But uh, basically, in the 80s, you have low resolution, uh, uh, low revisit frequency, and uh, and only few satellites. And on the right side of the of the slide, you can see what we can uh, actually monitor today. So I took different example. Uh, most of them are optical images, but uh, we can actually really see like uh, we have a, um, a camera and uh, from a plane, it's exactly the same, but it, it's on, on satellite. So we can uh, watch uh, the ship, we can uh, uh, monitor the forecast, we can uh, uh, monitor the algal bloom on the left uh, uh, and, and side, and we can also monitor uh, uh, asymmetry and at least coastal bathymetry, and, and Virginie could talk about that maybe later on. But uh, the main point here is like we have more and more resolution, very high resolution. We have uh, an increase in frequency of, of the revisit, and we, can, we have also what we call the near real-time uh, uh, capabilities. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the message here is um, I can't obviously describe all the maritime activities because, as I said at the beginning, they are really, really highly diverse. But the maritime sector is still growing. And with this growth, the needs that comes along with this growth. Um, so in the FIRE uh, workshop uh, um, this year, we, we started to identify this, uh, these needs. Uh, so I list some of them. They are not, uh, it's, it's not an exhaustive list. But uh, we have needs uh, of meta ocean, so better forecast and a better idea of waves, wind, and current at, and sea states, because there will be more and more ship in the water, or more and more, let's say, infrastructure in the water, and we need to to make sure that uh, the people on the sea uh, are safe and uh, and there is uh, no collision in between the boat and and so on. Um, we need obviously uh, more awareness of the maritime domain. Uh, for traffic, for vessel detection, for characterization. We need more monitoring. Uh, that could be uh, the, uh, the, the track of the ship, uh, the routing, but also the facilities, the offshore works, uh, to, uh, to make sure that everything is fine. And only uh, Earth observation, mainly, uh, with, uh, I should say, Earth observation can provide that. And we also need uh, this capacity of observing for uh, uh, pollution management, uh, make sure that everything is is good because, as I said at the beginning, I should have I should have add this word: sustainable use of the of the maritime area is a key to 
to, to make sure that the blue economy will last and, um, and will not damage uh, the ocean. You can push one more on the slide. But <laughs> there's quite a lot of challenges remain. Like, um, how do we basically put together a community of Earth observation? There are people that are dealing with satellite and data and the community of uh, of the maritime, uh, let's say maritime worm. It's not it's not so easy to, to put these this, uh, people together, especially experts like Virginie uh, uh, from IC, because she's uh, uh, an oceanographer, so she already knows both sides, but usually a uh, sailor, they don't talk with uh, uh, the staff from uh, from Earth observation. So it's, it's, it's remained a, a great challenge. If you go to the next slide. So the ambition, um, yesterday, that's where we were in the uh, 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 century, uh, seven, uh, 17th, uh, 6th century. We have a, a not really modern boat and not much uh, of uh, means to observe what's around. And today, if you push uh, one more, today that's where we are, like uh, quite smart boats uh, and uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, a lot of potential and a lot of uh, capacity to, to observe wh what is on, on the sea. So um, the ambition is, is really to, uh, I guess we have today like a, a great capacity to observe and it's not exploited at, at its best. Uh, and there is uh, plenty of, of, of things uh, to do to, to go further and to, to develop new application for the maritime world. If you tick one more, uh, tomorrow, I put this uh, this sentence uh, from a philosopher, the American philosopher Peter Drucker: "The best way to predict the future is just to create it." So it's really in, in our end to be able to to develop the new application and new services that use uh, the Earth observation capabilities for the maritime world. And we're here to discuss that, I believe. Exactly. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Phil. This was really inspiring, and and I think. Uh, you you nailed it there with this uh, with this last quote. Um, I would invite now our two evangelists, Eva Haas, head of strategic accounts at EOMAP, and Juan Peña, CEO at Orbital EOS, to take the floor and, and essentially evangelize a little bit around how <laughs> this ambition, this future, will be uh, realized. So the floor is yours. Okay. So good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will try to share my screen uh, so you can see the presentation. Okay. So I guess now you, you should be seeing the, the presentation, right? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, it was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I feel myself uh, recognized in all the words that you that you erased. So my, my name is Juan Peña, and with my colleague uh, Eva Haas, I will be speaking about uh, marine and maritime applications using Earth observation. Well, um, as you know, we live in the era of information. Uh, but it, it's not hard to recognize that we currently have more questions than answers about the world we live in. And this is especially true when speaking about the ocean. And the reasons are very, very clear. The ocean is very big. It's quite complex. And it is a very, very dynamic environment as well. So fortunately, uh, as Philip mentioned, we have uh, we have uh, uh, picture cameras in space. We have cameras in space. We have satellites, and satellites hold three main advantages to address challenges in the maritime domain. First of all, they see the big picture. They have a big eye. They never rest. They work all the time, and they transcend all human boundaries. We can see any point of the ocean with satellites. OK, but what kind of uh, things uh, can we do with satellites? Well, like Philip, uh, like Philip mentioned, we can use it to communicate, right? Like, for instance, having internet connection in, in open seas. We can use it to locate objects, like being aware or of where ships are, so we can control maritime traffic. 
and we can observe uh, using satellites as well. For instance, to detect an oil spill close to the shoreline, which is uh, very, very important for us. Okay, but compare okay, satellites with other, let's say, more traditional te technologies. What would be the benefits? What's 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 the take here? Well, first of all, we can potentially monitor very, very large areas. We can observe at different scales, different resolutions. We're talking here about telecommunications as well, not only about pictures of the Earth. It is very easy to combine this data with other sources of data, so we can enhance the intelligence. It is objective information coming from space. It is digital and it can be delivered very fast in near real time. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to present some applications of how we can use satellite data, how we can use Earth observation to solve real problems of real people. Well, for instance, uh, um, as, as Philippe mentioned, to detect ships at sea, to be aware of, of where ships are, it's crucial nowadays. So what, what we can do is to automatically analyze satellite data on a regular basis. Again, we can observe at different scales. So we can observe small ships or very big ships. And if, you, if we fuse this data with other sources of data like AIS, uh, LRIT, or signal intelligence, we can again enhance the level of information that we can, we can gather. It is a very, very cost-efficient, uh, cost-effective way of, of monitoring uh, large or sensitive areas. We can do this during day uh, and during the night as well, and even through the clouds. It is definitely the only feasible way uh, in, in, in very remote areas, and we can deliver uh, this information quite fast. So what would be the applications for ship detection using, using satellites? Well, first of all, we can detect illegal fishing. Uh, secondly, we can help uh, in custom surveillance, which is a huge problem, as you know, in Europe, search and rescue operations, and also law enforcement. Uh, this kind of information can be easily embedded in uh, decision-making tools, which normally the users have, and the clients tend to be national coast guards, custom departments, maritime authorities, and defense. Another very interesting uh, application that is in the news almost every month, as you, as you know, it's uh, the, the detection of oil spills. Again, we can monitor at different scales, at different levels of, of detail and resolution. Normally, the state of the art uh, relies on automatic or semi-automatic analysis of satellite uh, images. Uh, it is, again, a, a very, very cost-effective way of monitoring very large areas, much, much uh, more cost-effective than using drones or aircraft, as you, as you can imagine. We can do this proactively or uh, only when we have an emergency, when we have the problem. Uh, we can easily integrate uh, trajectory forecasting models to understand not only where is the oil spill now, but where is it going to be in the next few hours so we can prepare properly. Uh, this information can be delivered quite, quite fast as well nowadays. And normally, uh, this kind of service are, are embedded in early warning systems uh, for emergencies. We can also help authorities to detect deliberate pollution produced by ships, which unfortunately is a very, very uh, crucial problem for authorities, uh, especially the enforcement of uh, international treaties like MARPO. And the clients uh, of uh, oil spill monitoring services tend to be uh, the oil and gas industry and uh, maritime and environmental authorities. So now I will pass uh, the floor to my colleague uh, Eva Haas, and she will be speaking about uh, marine applications. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let me just share my slides and the continuation. And um, just a second. That's the beauty of shared presentations, but um, we will. Okay, just a second. That 
that's it. Okay, I hope you can see the presentation well now. Yes, yes, we can. Great. So, thanks for these good examples, Juan, and let me continue with a scenario that um, I guess maybe some of you already uh, experienced by themselves. So, imagine you are a decision maker with a pile of work on your desk. And I guess at least that part of the scenario, everybody has experienced that. So, this poor decision maker has to monitor water quality and also say when there are harmful algae blooms coming up, for large stretches of coastal areas or several tens or hundreds of water bodies. He has not only come, sorry? Just, sorry to break you. Could you just please make it in presentation mode? I'm sorry, it's actually for me, it looks like presentation mode. Um, okay. Uh, is, that, is that now presentation mode for you? No. No. I don't know, Juan, would you like to share and then I just, because yours looked good. I don't know, can I pressing presentation mode? Yeah, I see you're doing, so, sorry for that, but. Yes. It's, it's, maybe it's much, much easier for the audience to follow that if it's in presentation. Yes. Do you want me to, so, to, to share it, uh, Eva? Yes. Juan, yes, if, you, if could. you could, Juan. Sorry for yes. this disruption. No worries. Um, so now I think everybody feels like this poor decision maker with loads of work <laughs> on his desk. <laughs> and I will give you a solution in a moment. So probably that's the least problem of the decision maker that he cannot open PowerPoint. This poor guy has much yeah, more complicated problems to solve. And I'm just continuing the speech while the slides are opening. Actually, the main problem is that he has to communicate that to also different audiences. So the decision maker has to communicate that to citizens, maybe to the National Environment Agency, then to the International Environment Agency, and it's just too much for him. The good news is the earth observation industry has up and running information services that help you to show, oops, now it's Sorry. not anymore. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. So this is the thing we talk about high tech and the little tech doesn't work, but I think now it's perfectly fine. So the good news is that we have actually up and running services and the decision maker doesn't have to worry too much about what's happening in the background and can receive that ready to use. And if I say that, well, in this case, it would be the monitoring of potentially toxic algae blooms that are formed by cyanobacteria. We can deliver that in two to 500 meter spatial resolution and also up to a daily coverage. What are the benefits? Well, you get a cost-effective monitoring of marine and inland water bodies. You do not have to send all your staff there and your pile of work will not increase. You get it ready to use. You can also get harmonized data with the global coverage if your region is extended. And you can look to the past, which is beautiful because we saw before, yeah, we have good data archives and um, yeah, it allows for a historical analysis. Applications are definitely early warning in the case of harmful algae blooms and also the knowledge about their spatial and seasonal dynamics. This is important for fishing, for aquaculture and also for tourism. So efficient environmental risk assessments and cost saving management response actions are in for you if you go and get this kind of service. What are the clients that we normally talk to? Well, we talk to regional authorities environmental engineers and also the oil and gas industry. And I brought a second example. Here, the setting is a bit more complicated because the stakeholders that are involved in this scenario, they do not, I would say, like each other. They are in the offshore asset monitoring, often different parties involved. You have, for example, a port authority that has a certain ambition. You have environmentalists, you have lawyers. And you have also often, or yeah, fishermen associations. So you have a lot of different stakeholders. What we can provide as uh, Earth observation from Earth observation side is unbiased and also objective information. In this case, about the turbidity and suspended matter that comes uh, during dredging operations. So this information is quite detailed, which is needed in kind also of these um, yeah discussions that are ongoing in building uh, um, projects. And we provide that from two to 500 meter spatial resolution as well 
up to daily coverage. Again, here cost effectiveness is a key point as well as the reduction of health and safety and environmental risks. We can provide reporting and baseline analysis and also here we have the historic data at hand. Examples and applications are the monitoring uh, of pipelines and also port constructions and as we heard before the growing sector of uh, wind farm, offshore wind farms. Mainly it's for fulfilling regulatory requirements and clients are again oil and gas, port authorities and energy operators. So the next slide please. One. Now let's talk about sectorial challenges because we have all these nice services available, but it's no, not always that easy to bring that to the decision maker with this full pile of work on the desk. Let me start with some trends in the sector and also showing what the future holds. Well, definitely the marine sector is a channel for transport and energy and Earth observation can help and, and we heard that before detection of illegal marine activities. Uh, it helps also for greater international collaboration and um, we know that the rise of offshore wind energy production will need this type of information. Also post-processing of met ocean data is a key point. Well, we are dealing at the same time with marine pollution and also climate change. So we are looking worriedly at the rising sea levels. Uh, we see increased fuel and littering pollution, loss of marine biodiversity and the shift in global currents. So what can we do? And this is on the next slide. What can we do for the sector? Well, what does the sector need is the question then first. So the ideal marine sector uses earth observation data for one hand, improved information and forecasting, also to support decision making and here at all levels, then an easier control of international compliance with inter environmental norms, high awareness about impact of ocean pollution and the marine environment, and the cost and risk reduction, here it is again. So, before we can serve the sector, we have to combat some barriers. But of course, before you combat barriers, you have to identify them. So, in the first step, it's identifying barriers, then it's translating these barriers into needs, and then it's working together and implementing joint projects. Let's start with identifying the barriers and on the next slide you will see a multitude of barriers. So yes, there is still some work to do and I will ask Juan to go directly to the next slide because of the sake of time and I will highlight four of those barriers for you. Well, the most or let's say the most common thing that we hear from uh, EU industry side is the difficulty to integrate this with existing hardware and data sets. People are used to work in their environments. Now you come with exciting new things and they're like, I don't even have time to install that. I don't even know what the admin rights are. So it's too complicated. What we need is modular solutions that fit onto existing infrastructures. Here, the good news is it's already there. This is, um, it's common to set up these modular solutions, but it cannot be stressed enough that this is really the only key for success if you want to work with clients. Then we are facing, of course, also ethical questions. Is it acceptable to track a vessel at all the time? Yes, it's possible, but can you really do that? Uh, the solution here is a bit that safety solutions shouldn't compromise privacy. Another one is uh, what are the drivers to implement, uh, to implement innovative solutions? This goes towards the international regulations. Nobody would at their own cost probably detect plastic litter as a government, but if you're obliged to do so, all of a sudden technologies that allow that will be bought and yeah, also driven, let's say. The last point is also important and we have to blame it a bit on the side of the earth observation sector. And also this, we heard it before. Yes, we do speak maybe the same language, mostly it's English. And um, yeah, we do not understand still the requirements um, of the end user. So we need really more interaction. We need to leave the silos. We need to communicate, we need to connect and yeah, a way of bringing EO and industry expertise closer together, I think, is this forum. And uh, Juan and me as Earth Observation Evangelists will also do our best to fulfill that. And with this, I would like to close. I have two messages. One message is uh, to our customers that are, I guess, out there. I'm looking at the uh, distribution who is there. 
Um, yes, we can foster ecological, but also, and it's very important, economical sustainability through better information. And to the colleagues from the EO sector, I would like to say just one slogan. Well, let's dive deeper into this blue sector. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eva. Thank you very much, Juan. Indeed, let's try to dive deeper into the blue economy and, and, and understand user requirements and, and also Let's try now to, to look into some different aspects that will help us build a sort of strategy for the future. Um, at the end of the day, this is the ultimate output that FIRE aspires to build. So um, I'm very happy to have in this process and in this effort um, very nice and esteemed colleagues. So Jonathan Williams, CEO of MSC International, will be joining the panel, as will Virginie Lafont. She's Associate Executive Director and Head of Space Applications at IC. And this basically is the moment where we are kickstarting a more free-flowing, if you wish, panel discussion where some of the points that were raised both by Phil and by Eva and Juan will be discussed. Um, hopefully, we'll also be getting questions by the audience that we will be addressing later on. The first point I would like to raise, and, and, and I'm raising that to Jonathan, is this notion of sustainability. So, of course, it's a it's a key word that is everywhere now. We heard Phil talk about it. We heard Eva now in the even in the last slide. But how is it really applying in the marine and maritime sector? And in a way, how does it set the agenda for innovation? So, how can we transform this word into practical things on the ground? Mm. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for that introduction and question. Um, and let me say how uh, uh, congratulate the, the previous speakers. A really good presentation and summary of uh, some really important points there. Um, when it comes to improving our ability to manage sustainability, uh, I think there's, there's a, we can look at a number, well, particularly two really important functions that we need to be able to perform. One is detection of trends that we don't yet know about, um, uh, which can signal uh, effects of unsustainability, which we need then to act on. Um, and when that action has taken place and you have policies in place, um, we need to be able to, uh, to ensure compliance and enforcement of those policies. So there's two really important functions that we need to be able to perform. Um, as has already been said, on the monitoring front, um, Earth Observation is in a very good place for maritime. It's, it's one of the few tools that we have for covering very large areas of ocean. Even a marine protected area of, say, a million square kilometres is really difficult to, to monitor uh, if you've only got vessels. So um, I think that's all been said. Of course, it doesn't help very much when it comes to underwater problems. Mm -hmm. So that's something we perhaps need to look at. And I think... Uh, the ability to deploy other instruments in the water column uh, and to fuse with with EO data is an area where we need to do a, be developing our capabilities a lot more effectively. Um, the other area which I mentioned, which is uh, compliance and enforcement, I think, uh, again, some useful stuff has been said already. But the, the area which is a real problem that we see is actually uh, determining the identity of a, an illegally behaving vessel. Very hard from satellite, uh, as we know. Um, so again, we need, we need tools at our disposal, which will allow us to use the satellite, yes, for doing risk profiling, so that you can identify where the high risk locations are, maybe identify behavior uh, of a vessel which looks very suspicious, and EMSA are doing a great deal of work in that area. Um, but when you've got, when you've done that, you then got to have some way of actually determining the identity of the vessel. It's IMO registration number, so you can bring the owner to court, essentially. So um, that's where we need other tools at our disposal. And I think um, deployment of drones, for example, from vessels can help with this. Um, High altitude platforms, I think, is an area that we perhaps haven't put enough attention into in seeing how they can complement satellite remote sensing to give us that much finer resolution that you would need to actually positively identify um, a, a, a vessel which is behaving or potentially behaving illegally. So I know I haven't got very long and I've probably 
said more than my share now, but I'll, so I'll shut up. But those, from our experience, are just a couple of um, really crucial crucial tools we really need to develop better. Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. No, I mean, no, no worries for the time. We, we we will be exactly on time at the end. Uh, I can I can guarantee you that, and we should have a dynamic and, and, and nice interaction among us. Um, you, you brought up the, the point about certain technological solutions that are perhaps underexploited. EO, at least among those practicing or, or working towards that, is also considered as something that is underexploited. And I would like to pass the floor to Virginie to tell us a little bit how can we build this future of cleaner, smarter, more efficient operations, more environmentally friendly, and so on, with the industry developing the solutions being active in. So, what, What's the role of the industry? How can can we have a you know sustainable involvement of the industry in that? And I'm afraid that the moment I raised the question, Virginie literally dropped out. <laughs> so maybe someone else wants to to comment on that, Phil, perhaps, while while Virginie is reconnecting. Can you re-ask the question exactly? Yeah. Just to make sure I have the right answer. No, I mean, and, and actually in your case, it's also interesting because you represent an entity that has all sorts of organizations very well uh, attached to it or, or even as members. The question is, how can industry, how can industrial players from the technology supply side enter into this picture and, and provide solutions for sustainability, for smarter operations, more environmentally friendly things and so on? Well, I think if if the solution users' observations is already what what was said, like uh, the um, the capability of first observation to observe on a large scale, so that's avoid um, obviously uh, a lot of staff going in and uh, in and out uh, on boats if we consider maritime activities and uh, um, uh, using fuel and using using a, a lot of a lot of means to to observe and to to deliver the service that that is supposed to to be delivered. So uh, this earth observation can uh, this capability they can do that um, locally. Virginie is back, but, uh, yeah, but also uh, at the world <laughs> at the world scale as well. So it definitely brings another way to address the challenges of uh, observing. Uh, the ecosystem so by itself interestingly it's yes. it's sustainable all right um virginie i i will ask you to pitch in on the next question actually yeah uh, sure sorry. <laughs> sorry we we missed you exactly at the nick of time when 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 the question was raised to you um yeah, okay. but i i still want to to stick for a little while longer on the supply side, but most of the rest of the discussion will actually be around the demand side as, as it should. But one thing that really strikes me is how whenever we talk about solving certain challenges in a certain sector, and, and, and marine and maritime is no, 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 uh, no different, we talk about digitalization, we talk about automation, it's even in the, in the poll that we have raised. Um, we talk about high-performance computing, or, or, or now Jonathan was, was talking about the uh, high-altitude platforms. So how, how much of this is just techy words, and how much of it is really going to bring solutions to, to, these, to these challenges that the sector is faced with? And which ones will do you, do you expect to drive things forward in the sector? So that's that's raised an address to Virginie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, well, the industry has a major role to play and, and satellite remote sensing has a, has a major, major role to play in a, in a kind of major transformation. And I think uh, we, we must think about transformation of current practices. Um, I had uh, two examples in mind. I think it joins what, what was said before, but uh, the, the first example concerns sport industries, in particular the, the regulation of dredging activities that alter the water quality. Earth observation and satellite remote sensing is, is an amazing tool to contribute to the surveillance and the optimization of works at sea to prevent deleterious impacts of the works on ecosystems, natural ecosystems, but also aquaculture and shellfish sites. This new technology is mature. We operate operational services, 
uh, at location where the impact of anthropogenic activities on water quality is evident and how boards in France have supported the development of this uh, powerful tool for, uh, for their own usage because they are conserved, uh, concerned with biodiversity preservation. And uh, well, I, I truly think that biodiversity uh, preservation should always be a major objective, a major driver for all maritime activities. For instance, uh, the tourism industry, and this is my second example, should more massively in invest at sea and not only exclusively on land, where the impact, we all know that on the new soil artificialization, sorry, human habitat densification are already critical with in turn impacts on sea water quality and marine life. Um, I think that tourism industry should, should uh, participate to the development of green infra infrastructure uh, in coastal areas. Uh, in many locations, we built different walls against the sea, which is a very terrible <laughs> concept, uh, to stop erosion effects. But we obtain very, very short delays. Uh, where, wherever possible, we must start long-term sustainable innovative renat renaturalization projects that will be uh, that will all at once at least attract tourists, favor marine ecosystems, and, and contribute to protect the shoreline much much more efficiently than worlds. And these walls, uh, if we consider several decades of sea level rise, with earth observation, coastal erosion hazards is quantified. Um, together with shallow water topography, as it was mentioned by Phil. And this allows to project the coastline in the future to define well-balanced coastal planning, well-balanced to favor goods, activities, and, and people resilience. These were the, the examples that I wanted to raise today. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Virginia. This is, uh, this is very helpful. I, I, I very much like the idea that a sector as big as tourism should start investing more <laughs> at sea and, and not only on the coastal side of things. Um, mm -hmm. I think with this, I, I would just want to very quickly, although we don't have too many answers to this, but maybe a very rapid response from the panelists on the key trends that are shaping uh, the sector. And, and, and we see that automation and, and climate change or population growth are all picked up. Decarbonization, interestingly enough, no one considers it to really be driving things. So any any quick comments from the panelists on that? Just jump up. If I may. Yes, please, please go ahead. Well, uh, on the technical side, I would say that the, the very, very interesting thing and the, the big, huge, I would say, opportunity that we have is that we can transform Earth observation into Earth intelligence because now Earth observation and AI is are overlapping. Uh, so in the past, we have tons of data and it was very, very hard to work with the data and to provide answers to final to customers, to final users. But now we have this amazing uh, AI that can help us retrieve the relevant information that at the end is what uh, users need. They, they need answers. They don't need satellite data. Um, yeah, so the, uh, on the technological side, I would say this is the more the more relevant the more relevant um, in, I mean driver of of how earth observation can help. And on the demand side, I think the climate change sustainability is going to be huge. I mean, um, and and the fit between earth observation and sustainability is is in my vision is amazing. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Juan. Sorry. Yeah, please, please, please yeah, okay. do so. Um, I mean, I think just a, a different view. I, I, I totally agree with the AI and data analytics scope is enormous. And that's where a lot of the value add will come from and where a lot of the investment will be justified. But the other area which I I think is, is really driving things in a way which EO can play a major role in, and that has to be, in my reckoning, the illegal fishing uh, area. Um, work done by or funded by the African Union a few years back has highlighted uh, uh, what I can only call sort of criminally catastrophic levels of, of illegal fishing around the coast of Africa. And uh, I think there's a lot we can do there, actually. Um, we just need to get on and do it. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a potential and there's a, there's a need there. So I think we should, that's got to be a big area of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. 
This actually brings me to, to the next wave of our discussion around gaps and challenges. Of course, we have already been uh, touching upon that because, I mean, especially now in a, in a forum like this, I'm sure people from the European Commission or institutions in general related to, to the blue economy will be listening in or, or will be watching the video afterwards. And we see many um, instruments, many initiatives, many uh, types of, of framework programs and so on, supporting activities, especially around innovation in this sector. And I would like to ask Phil, but again, anyone that wants to, to also give a quick uh, insight on that, you're free to do so. You know, what is the true impact of these activities and, and what should we do differently or more than that? Okay, we, um, I mean, there's, there's already, let's, let's put that back in perspective. Um, decades ago, there was not uh, such a good initiative that uh, the European Commission can put on the table that uh, it exists today. And um, there, there are different calls like the ESMA call, uh, the EMFF call and stuff like this that are dedicated to uh, uh, maritime uh, activities. And uh, on the other side, there are different calls dedicated to Earth observation, maybe not enough, but, but uh, at least on the Copernicus side, there's, there's quite a good things. Um, all these activities uh, and these opportunities, I should say, they are here to help to, to de-risk uh, the innovation that is required to make sure that uh, Earth observation is some sort of uh, uptake uh, by uh, the maritime activities. And we need, we need this. We need this, uh, this money to trigger the development of the new services and, and the new applications that help um, the Earth observation to, to support maritime activities. What I... So... I could say like I can't say there's there's nothing. So there's already a lot of good things, but uh, as usual, it's either not enough maritime or not enough Earth observation, and and the dream would be for us really to to have this combination. And I know it already exists in the uh, Cosmi uh, Cosmi Go International because we had a uh, uh, Jonathan is actually uh, involved in in one of the projects Space to Wave, and we are involved in with the Ask in the uh, connect your project and this project just are able to connect uh, some sort of uh, thematic uh, activities and earth observation and that's what that's really what we need to to go uh, beyond what we are able to do here and and make sure that uh, all the companies like i see uh, from virginie and, and the other companies are able to to make sure that they develop they can sell their services uh, outside europe and make sure that there's a real business coming. Maybe to, to follow up on this, and I would like to ask Eva uh, um, to comment on this, because you, you mentioned uptake. Um, you also mentioned this type of projects that bring communities together. So what should we do to, to increase uptake from your perspective, Eva? I mean, beyond having projects like that. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I think again, the uptake and I, I go back to my decision maker example that I had before, you have to make it easy for people to use the data. So my buzzword or sentence would be sectorized digital decision support solutions. Translated in that, it's like a bit like the weather forecast. I mean, I look in the morning on my mobile phone, I see a sun and I take my sunglasses. I go mm -hmm. to the mobile phone, I see a rain cloud. Okay, uh, I take my coat. So we should make it easier for the customers. And I think two points that we should really focus on, because one is to provide data, even if it's easy to use. The key point is really the quality on one hand. People need to be sure that what they get is reliable. Because if I go five times outside and I see the sun <laughs> on my mobile phone, but then I'm totally poured over with rain, I, I stop trusting this tool. So quality is important. And the other one is really the customer care. And I think this is maybe what makes a difference to a normal portal. On a normal portal, you might get information that is useful for you and it's cool as a start, but you really have to care about your customer and you have to be available for them and you have to help them on the journey. So I, I think these two things are yeah, crucial to foster the uptake because otherwise, um, yeah, we will lose 
customers on the way. And we want the opposite. We want more people to use Earth observation. If, Thank if, you. if I, if I yes, may, please. Uh, mm -hmm. we, I think uh, we will know when it, when it will be a success, when actually Earth observation or, or uh, space data or stuff like this will be uh, um, transparent or will be, we, we won't talk about it. It, yes. it, yeah. it, it needs to go straight like uh, like the forecast, like the weather. Exactly. You don't you don't even know today that, or you don't you don't think that today that we use satellite to monitor the sky and the sea and blah blah blah. Yes. It will be the same for the other activities. Like we don't want to hear anymore about Earth observation or stuff like this. We just want the services and the application. Exactly, uh, Phil. Yeah. This is this is very true. Of course, it introduces a sort of paradox that you have to talk a lot about something until yeah. you don't talk about it anymore. But uh, I said I said in my presentation, it, it remains some challenges. That's for sure. <laughs> yes, and the technical work at the background remains, of course. So we're not um, eradicating that. It's just a way to make it easier. I, I agree, okay. Phil. <laughs> But um, I wanted to bring a little bit Jonathan and Virginie in that discussion too, also reflecting on the fact that on the poll that we now have open about things that hinder greater uptake, uh, even again, if the, the sample is not extremely large, we do see a little pattern here that most people think it's the lack of skills on the user side. So maybe Virginie and Jonathan, you could comment on that aspect. Okay, interesting one. Um, I think it depends what you mean by the user, probably. Um, I think um, uh, I think there is an enormous uh, gap, uh, barrier really, in um, the community of organizations that are really investing heavily in how they can exploit satellite data and other data sources. Um, as I said earlier, I think the data analytics, the AI has got an enormously, enormously promising future in this in this domain, and I think that um, that can only um, help to to uh, to build up the capability in terms of the user of data. Of course, the user of the services is different, and I don't think that the, I don't think the answer to this question is being tr triggered by users of services. I think the point that's being made is about the users of the data. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> 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 yes, Virginia, for sure. would you like to add something? Yes. Yes, yes. Our clients are not skilled and, and they don't really want to uh, uh, to participate in too complex uh, data processing. It's not their purpose, but they are quite confident now in the use of satellite remote sensing because they are more used anyway to the data. The data are everywhere, satellite data are everywhere. Um, and, and they start to use a little bit uh, this data, but they don't want to have nothing to do with uh, artificial intelligence and things like that. Um, what is um, important for them is just to, uh, to have an index of, of confidence, confidence index on the, on the value we give. So we, we quantify things and we have to say, oh, it's uh, well, uh, you have a, a narrow bar of uh, I don't know, 50 or 20 centimeter on the on the bathymetry on the topography, for instance. Uh, well, the uh, biomass is uh, that value, and with more or less uh, this uh, confidence, that's what they want, and, and they are confident when when they have this uh, this um, way of working. Yes. But then. Yeah. Would you see this confidence index as the sort of equivalent to the little sun or or clouds sign that Eva was talking about earlier? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, that's that's an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not easy for us to do things like that, but uh, no, but we we are working with scientists most most part of the time. We're working, for instance, with them. Um, um, marine uh, nature park and these people are scientists like like me and we talk the same language and so maybe it, it's not as simple as what we we see on on tv <laughs> uh, well for 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 cloud and, and sun but uh, anyway um, we can speak the same language and we can speak about aerobar in the same way this is not uh, a very big thing but um, it, it's our role uh, to develop the usage of, of satellite remote sensing and, and, and to bring to bring it in a very simple way to 
to them. They don't want simple things. It's not that. But we just have to share the same language and it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. If I if I can contribute, um, sure. I, I totally yeah I, I totally agree with the with the concept. Um, I would say I have Alexa in, in my bathroom, and I use Alexa to play music when I'm getting a shower, and I say, Alexa, Rolling Stones. So I don't need any skill at all, right? I need thing. Question uh, is that. I mean, the challenge is not that our customers don't have skills. The challenge is that we cannot make these questions ourselves because this is our job. Mm -hmm. you, you can't expect your customers to have skills. You, you can expect your customers to have a need to think, to talk, and to pay. I mean, that's all. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that one is, this is one of the biggest challenges in, in, in our industry. We should spend 80% of the time speaking to people speaking to customers and 20% of the time developing solutions. This is my, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a nice perspective. And actually, this is a nice segue to the, to the next wave of discussion, which is more on opportunity for Rio and how to seize it. So, you know, when, when you would spend this 80% talking to the customers and 20% building the solution, which areas would that be? Where, where do we? Where, where do you feel? And this is an open, an open question to the whole panel, and, and you can have a sort of rapid fire response. Uh, where is the real value proposition of first observation? Maybe I can fire first, as <laughs> <laughs> sure. because I, I, I think for my my answer is none of these fields, but all of them. It's a bit cryptic because there are data gaps in all of these fields, and we just have to find these gaps of information and fill them. So it's not one field in particular, but it's really identifying where the biggest needs it, biggest need is, and there is a need in all of these sectors. So more general observation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I can chip in with a specific, um, just drawing on a piece of work that we were doing a while ago for uh, an information service to fishermen or shell fishermen, to be more precise, about when when they should be not harvesting because of a uh, water quality problem, and it became clear that what they wanted was something really simple, literally a traffic light with a green if there was no risk, uh, a red if they shouldn't want under any circumstances harvest shellfish on, on that day, an amber if it was uncertain, in which case they can either risk it or not. But you know, we, 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 we inform the, the end user in a way that makes sense for their them in their operational environment, which in their case was a pretty simple one, but they wanted they wanted something that they could they could you know understand where the uncertainty was and where the certainty was. Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. Anyone else wants to share some thoughts on the value proposition? Mm, yeah, well, for me, observation is really fantastic for coastal environmental monitoring. Um, with with EO, uh, with satellite remote sensing, we can map marine habitats at so large scale, several tens to hundreds of square kilometers at once. We can go back in time thanks to, to historical image archives. It is just amazing. We were not there and, and we have, you know, we have the image. And we can obtain from this image very, very precise pictures of, of, of the ecosystems and almost every year for the past 15 to 20 years. This is a huge database to understand how the coastal ecosystem have changed, how these changes can be related to land use and coastal plannings, because we can also map um, what, what happens at the scales of watersheds. Um, we can also understand how these changes can be related to the development of maritime activities and any other pressure. So it is a very, very efficient basis, database to understand and propose mitigation measures to the decision makers because what they want to do is to change the trajectories, ecological trajectories when they are wrong, when we go on the wrong way. So yeah, it is really, really fantastic. I would say in other words and maybe shorter, the capability of capturing time and space. It's, it's really that. Like, uh, as as Virginie uh, said, the archives you can go back in uh, in time. You have this capability of uh, 
looking on your garden or on your beach, but also everywhere else in the world, it's 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 amazing the potential it has, and it's not exploited. But so then this brings us to to the very obvious question that. You know, we're talking about something so beautiful, so powerful, and at the same time, we're saying that it's not exploited enough. So the question now is actually twofold. One, if you were given the power to write down and, and implement the strategy for R&D in this sector, what would be the one thing that you would focus or, or put your money on? So it's again, rapid fire style. Okay, let me chip in. Um, I think one of the one of the barriers that we've encountered is the time, the, the latency of getting the data back. So if you're in an operational field where you need decision support information, you need it quickly. And if it takes hours or even days sometimes, in one case we had working with a partner that took a month to get the data through their system with all the quality assurance and this sort of stuff. Um, and that's no good in an operational context. It's fine for, you know, maybe for trend analysis in a scientific context. It's not all right if you're trying to make operational quick decisions. So I think getting that, reducing that latency would be one area that I'd uh, like to see more investment in. I might, I might have uh, another view that is a bit different, but uh, I would hope it, it will help your observation and maritime activities. Is uh, and we we are already uh, carrying out a, a study on this, but using the regu regulatory framework uh, to sort of uh, put Earth observation into a regulatory uh, framework. We use it for the Mine uh, Strategy Framework Directive. We work on it, but on one side, the European Commission found a very good program, Copernicus. On the other side, they set up some uh, required. Uh, regulation and why these two programs or two initiatives doesn't talk to each other. So the European Commission could say like for the maritime stra uh, strategy from work directive, you need to use maybe 20% of uh, uh, Copernicus uh, data to solve mm -hmm. or to. So that's what that's what we work on at the moment, and uh, it could be another way to sort of de risk and inject some Earth observation in the way the the uh, let's say. Uh, the consultancy offices and stuff like this do their or provide their work. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, this is definitely a, a very important aspect. Anyone else wants to pitch in on this, where you would put your money, or 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 do you have some amazing idea that you don't want to share live? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we we did put a lot of money on biodiversity mapping, on water quality monitoring, coastal monitoring, environmental monitoring based on satellite data these past, uh, past years in my company. Um, I, I'm a bit sad about what I hear because it's not true that satellites are not used. They are maybe not used enough and maybe not used for everything. But uh, um, for sure, we still need to evangelize um, people because they are not used. That's it. And uh, and we have to develop, develop the usage. Uh, we have just to um, bring new and complementary um, uh, services and products. Um, uh, to, to the decision makers, uh, and that's it. Uh, so it's for sure a question of money, but it's not only a question of uh, research and development because there are already existing uh, products, and we should maybe start with that, um, with this portfolio, which is uh, well large and very large already, um, and and just uh, valorize it, you know, at uh, at European scale. So. There, there are some really good exploited capacities already, I think. I truly think that. And maybe just one, to, totally to add to your line of thought, really to strengthen uh, industry innovation so that we have the potential as EU industry to also do the research and grow. So it's like working on the 20% that Juan said before. So 80 is talking to customers, but of course you need to be innovative. And I think if these... Um, Industry innovation is uh, strengthened with programs because like the service providers are very close to the customers. And I think then also the, the R&D that is going in there will reach the customers. It's not a long way, it's a short way. So yeah, kind of absolutely. Support. 
Yeah. But, but in that regard, is it a question of funding or other elements around innovation support? So I think there are already good programs around, but it can always be more. So I think to, to support industry innovation in general, so that I think there is a trend there, definitely, and it's positive. But I just wanted to say that R&D per se, to go to a customer, you need also to involve the, the industry, the EU industry in this innovative pro process. All right. And perhaps, yeah. uh, so someone wanted to join in or no? I misread that. All right. Um, to conclude this part where we are discussing kind of on our own uh, without the audience very actively involved, I just wanted to ask, is there any specific practice? And I don't mean necessarily from the perspective of we did this for IUU or we did this for coastal monitoring. So more from, from a practice in terms of how stakeholders work together that you would see as a success story that needs to be replicate it or upscale it or, or imitate it? That's telling. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, I have one idea maybe which is more general, not to a customer, but more to a community. So the satellite-derived bathymetry, it's a, it's a community and uh, I think there was a lot of work in the past years to really strengthen that community and train them. So I think the key point or the success story is that this intensive training and community building, mm -hmm. that leads to the fact that people are really using these services. So maybe a general observation, if you build a community on a topic, a community of, like of, of real customers, uh, not, the, not the science community, which is also important, but like the customer community, and you maintain that and then you really go to the um yeah so community building and uh, the sdb there is an sdb day now that is really recognized with several hundred participants every year and that wasn't there some some years ago so that was built and we see an uptake of the use of the data in this community and maybe a general example yeah it's a good mm -hmm. example maybe maybe another practice a good practice is uh to get funding like the InnoSub project, to get voucher, make sure that you you have on one side uh, a, a provider of services and on the other side uh, some end users, and you have as a as a cluster for ourselves, for Jonathan and myself, for example, the voucher to make sure that uh, the SME or the startup can, uh, um, without uh, spending too much. And just uh, make a tailor-made services for the end user, and it, and you start like this, and then it it's 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 changed the way the people work, and they use some new uh, new services, new application, new way to do the things. I would fully support that actually, Phil. But the, the InnoSup project we're currently involved in with Aerospace Valley, it's been really really effective at getting SMEs engaged. Some of them who've never done this sort of stuff before. Um, so uh, I think that's a, it's a great model. And you were the lucky ones to, uh, to have one. Not yeah, a, indeed. indeed. To add and promote ERSC a bit, the, uh, the OCRA uh, project is also interesting. This is the research community that can then benefit from Earth observation data. Mm -hmm. That's really so cool. So more, more market pool mechanisms then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah. So there, there is a success story I want you to talk a little bit about. Uh, it's uh, BioCost. BioCost was a project, used to be a project five years, four years ago, and and now it's uh, it's an operational service. It's uh, about um, biodiversity ecosystem mapping, vegetation mapping. It started from location uh, at coast, and now it, it works everywhere. We started, uh, so it, it was funded by um, BPI in France, half funded and uh, and co-invested. Uh, we had five uh, pilot sites at the beginning, and now we have uh, every year uh, two, three, five, and now 10 more clients every year. So it's a huge, huge right. success history. It's based on, on satellite, high resolution satellite remote sensing and, and, and also um, field, uh, field campaigns, um, field, um, field surveys. Uh, it's based on artificial intelligence and uh, it works uh, well, quite well. It works well because it was co-constructed with our final clients 
So for sure, it's a key uh, because with these five pilot sites, we had the, the time to adjust between ourselves and to find the the, the, the find or the, the good way to talk with them and to and to bring a new uh, a new map support something they have never seen before. So it's new. Uh, it has its own limitation as all observation has, so we know absolutely quite well what we propose, what we do, and it's perfectly accepted by, by our clients, and it's very, very high quality. So it's uh, yeah, very nice success story for our company. Now it's uh, well, the, the service that uh, gives us some huge visibility on our future. So it's, uh, Excellent. Oh, this is very, very, very good. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and definitely co-design is, is something that yeah. starts to gain more more attention. Um, yeah. Speaking of co-design and, and wanting to open the floor also to the audience who have raised quite a few questions. Uh, I see that Anthony Graveline or Graveline um, has raised a few questions around illegal vessel activities. Um, I'm not sure exactly who is this addressed to, but I suppose maybe Juan Virginie or Eva, you would you would want to, to pick this up. Not me, maybe. <laughs> can you can you read out loud the question? Yes. So um, I will actually start from the second question, which is kind of connected mm -hmm. to the first one. So, for the specific use case of vessel tracking, what are your thoughts on the type of sensor to use, mode, minimal resolution, parameters for tasking? Mm -hmm. um... We, what we do uh, is uh, we can, well, it's not, uh, well, I don't know what is behind uh, vessel tracking, but anyway, we can uh, we can map uh, boats uh, in uh, mooring areas, for instance, using Playad data, very high resolution data, that's what the best. And we also made many tests with Sentinel-2, so 10 meter resolution, and amazingly, it gives also some very good results. We are still investigating a bit the solution because uh, Sentinel-2 is <laughs> uh, well, uh, very powerful because we have images every, every five days without CAD, so it's, uh, it's amazing. But very high resolution is, is, very, is very nice, but maybe more for mooring uh, areas than for uh, a navigation areas. So for tracking um, vessels that are uh, moving, I don't know what would be the best. There, there, are, there is actually some uh, new payload, and uh, one is uh, operated by uh, a startup based in Brittany called Ensign Labs. They use uh, what we call ELINT, electromagnetic mm -hmm. uh, intelligence. And so they can track the ship, um, even if this ship has the, is, uh, its uh, AIS or VMS off. And so uh, they use NanoSat. So they have, uh, with few nanosats, they have good revisits and they are able to, to detect them and uh, to put them on the map if they are located in a place where they're not allowed to ship or to fish or, or not. So with a, it's quite easy yeah. today to, to do it. We, we, um, I would say that one of the important, important developments has been the integration of AI, satellite AIS with, with um, SAR, for example. To, to give you a, a good combination of sensing capabilities that allows you to maintain um, a, a reasonable coverage of a vessel track. Um, so that's probably an important one. Um, but I think it comes back to the uh, potential of high altitude platforms. If you know there's an area, for example, a seamount, where there's a lot of illegal activity going on, it's worth having some dedicated infrastructure to to um, to monitor that, uh, so I think there's various tools that we can we can deploy for this. Yeah, so there, are, there are actually some uh, good services. Sorry, I, I cite companies, but uh, CLS, uh, which is a quite a big uh, company using Earth observation in France, uh, they have a, a service called MAS Maritime Awareness System, and they actually bring together AIS, VMS, uh, satellite images, radar, mm -hmm. optical, everything together. Yeah. And they, this tool is able to tell you like is, if the ship is fishing, if the ship is switching off his AIS, so it knows like there's start to be an alert here. And, and basically the behavior of the ship is monitored. And so they know exactly 
if things are going wrong. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks for this. And indeed, there are there are a few companies that uh, do this type of dark vessel monitoring using different means. Um, I would like to pick up two more questions that have a little bit more of a overarching, um, yeah, nature. Uh, one was raised by Monica, who is asking uh, Monica Miguel Lago from from Ersk, what about the EO bridges with the research infrastructures communities? in the marine domain, such as Euro Argo, EMSO, ERIC, Excel, ERIC, and so on. And, and you know, what should be the, the the role, I guess, of these communities in a strategic research innovation and the agenda? How how do they fit into this picture that we have been drawing together in this discussion? If anyone has any insights on that. It's hard to tell. I can tell you that well, probably like Virginie, that most people who own companies on Earth observation, they were former academics or researchers before. Uh, most of these companies, it's, it's, it's always the same type of profile. Uh, people, they, are, they, they, they were in the research and the, let's say, the Earth observation uh, research before, and they switched to the uh, entrepreneurship. But for the... Um, infrastructure, I guess all the data that are here, at least for Copernicus, they they are digested in the CMEMS, Copernicus Marine Environmental Monitoring Service. And it goes like this quite smoothly with the different research institute uh, calibrating and make sure that uh, all the data are right for the, for the modeling. So that's probably the main link I see here. Um, all right. I mean, listen, it's no same for us to not have a, a definite answer to this question. Uh, as far as I can maybe uh, yeah, respond to that is that to the extent that they do represent in situ observations uh, from the Copernicus also point of view, this is continuously gaining more interest and, and uh, let's say recognition. So I think that any any future development in the sector will have more in situ in it too. Um, and then, at least, at least, left. What you can say is like satellite by itself is not as powerful as when it has the in situ data together, and uh, probably also some other data around uh, to develop services. But uh, the in situ data are a component of what we use behind uh, Earth observation. So there's a link. There's a straight, a good relationship between. Them. Indeed, indeed. And maybe um, a final question that was raised. Well, it was not exactly a question. Jeff Smith um, made this point, but I think it's it's nice that you guys would um, would comment on that. That AI is not a magic bullet. Of course, it's it's vital in dealing with huge volumes of your data, but it doesn't generate intelligence. It's not it's not itself in the data, and it also has many hidden costs and biases. So. Any feedback on that would be interesting to, to have. If I may. I can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go on, right. Sorry, Philip. Uh, well, totally agree with, uh, with the statement. Um, the, in, in my opinion, my professional opinion, I think the, the problem is to understand the, the, the challenge that we have to solve. And the, I mean, the question we have to answer very, very uh, thoroughly. We have to, we need to understand very well what is the problem, then how, wh what data, what satellites do we use to, to answer this question? Uh, do we have enough data to, you know, prepare a data set for training uh, an AI? Because many times, it's not about the algorithm itself. It's about it's a huge task to prepare the training data set for the AI to learn. It's like teaching a child. You teach AI by repetition, but you need a lot, a lot of data. Uh, and and sometimes preparing this data is very difficult. Sometimes very costly, and sometimes totally impossible because you need experts uh, sometimes to do this. Um, 
So I think the potential is in understanding very well what can be, I mean, what is the use case that we need to solve and, and what data can fit to that use case. So it's not a magic ballot. I, I totally agree with that. But I think the magic is in understanding the whole supply chain, all the aspects of the supply chain, rather than saying AI is the magic bullet of it's it's the data, it's the experts, it's the labeling, and it's the, the architecture of the network, or I mean, if we are using deep learning or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's understanding all this a puzzle very well. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I see there are no other questions. Uh, there are a few points in the discussion, uh, which is sort of reaffirming things that were already raised. So I think with that, I will actually close the session. Um, let me tell to all uh, participants in the audience that there will be um, a debriefing, so to say, of what was discussed here. So um, a rapporteur. Uh, Karel Kalevert from BVA will be presenting it during the next plenary, where we'll convene together with the other sessions that are happening in parallel. Um, so I invite you all to, to join in there and, and listen to that. You will also see, uh, sort of again, because here you had the chance to see it as it was progressing, this fantastic uh, graphic recording that is done by, by Gabriela and her team. Um, and otherwise, let me just say that Again, this this discussion that we have had now, and, and I'm really, really grateful to all of our panelists and speakers for, for sharing their thoughts and, and insights, will feed into um, the work done by the FIRE project to draft um, recommendations for a strategic research innovation agenda in this domain. So hopefully this will come out to be very actionable, very you know down to earth, if I can do a pun there. Um, and with that, I wish you all a very nice afternoon. Again, big thanks to all of you for contributing to this. Big thanks to our audience for raising the uh, questions. And uh, see you soon in the, in the plenary session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ben.